This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Hello. Um, thanks for turning up, I suppose is the first thing I should say. Um, I run the Urban History Seminar up in Cambridge, and this would be considered a vast audience. Um, so thank you very much for doing me that honour. Um, Class the Railways in Greater London um, is a subject which has been done before. Um, many people are probably well aware um, of H.J. Dios and his work on workmen's trains in South London. Um, he published that article back in the 50s, uh, and then quite a lot of work was done in the 60s and 70s. And actually, most recently, about three years ago, another book came out which examined urban labour, which was Janet Pulaski's. So I think it was probably worth going through the historiography first, um, like any good undergraduate. And so, basically, what's traditionally been argued about, especially working class of urbanisation, which is what we're going to be looking at, especially today, is that, essentially, it was too expensive to be done before the First World War. Workmen's trains, which are a, basically a cheap form of transport, they're usually run at, say, around half or even lower than the third class ordinary fare, are, remain basically too expensive for the vast majority of labour to move outwards. Coupled to this is the need for essentially those men in casual occupations to be near the centre of London to command the urban labour market and furthermore their needs of their family and sometimes wives to also um, command that, that the same labour market. Uh, traditionally it's been argued, and Dios does this, that it was simply too inconvenient, too expensive, and there weren't enough job opportunities to move outwards into, into the suburbs. And this is something which I should be challenging slightly today. Um, though in fairness to Dios, he does point out that the two penny workman's trains were something of a success, and that is something we will be focusing on. The other, perhaps, major player is Kellett, who wrote The Impact of Railways on Victorian Cities. Um, who argued that, for the most part, development of a suburb was, came about before the railway reached it. So the amount of impact a railway had on a sub on suburban development was fairly limited. The character of the suburb already existed, and then the railway basically increased the population. Again, that's something that will also be challenged, hopefully convincingly. Um, the way sort of historians have seen the process of suburbanisation in the late 19th century has varied wildly. So, for example, Nubian Turner argued that in the 1880s and 1890s it was a sort of wave of middle-class suburbanisation. Alan A. Jackson would have added the sort of middle stratum of the working class and the elite working class to that as well, by which we mean sort of the highly paid um, artisans and sort of compositors, the kind of people who are earning about 30 shillings a week. Um, Garside argued that, for example, up until about 1900, there was a sort of brief splurge of working class urbanisation, but after that point it sort of fizzles away. And Pulaski, most recently, in Reforming Urban Labour, 2010, it's a very good book, I recommend you buy it, um, basically repeats sort of a similar range of arguments, that the only people who can afford to move out before World War I are this sort of elite of the working class. It's very much a middle class phenomenon, and wherever, you know, wherever working class urbanisation does happen, it's exceptionally exceptional. My argument, and the one I will be putting to you today, is that actually... The arguments made about the 1880s are based on contemporary sort of commentators such as Lord Shaftesbury and Octavia Hill, who said in the 1880s to the, for example, the 1882 Select Committee on Artisans and Labourers' Dwellings and the 1884 to 85 Royal Commission on the Housing of the Working Classes, that essentially working class urbanisation was very, very difficult. I'm going to argue that that is valid for the period before the 1880s, but not after. Hopefully what I'm going to show is that you do get casual labour living in some of the most outer suburbs of London by around 1899. And that predates you know, most sort of interpretations of when this begins to happen. I'm also going to argue that the same can be said for subsidiary owners such as women and children. And that, again, you find these people out in the suburbs and commuting to work before the First World War. What I'm also going to argue is that the railways have typically been presented as being quite passive in this. So it's the fact that certain lines offer very cheap fares, and that's why people move. The railway companies are very, very actively involved in, to use something of a pun, shunting people into certain suburbs. Um, they are very, very aware of the kinds of passengers they have. 
they don't like some of the passengers they have, and they're very, very protective of their middle class suburbs. And when we deal with areas such as, say, Edmonton and Walthamstow, which become almost sort of contemporary infamous working class suburbs, we'll see that actually you have railway companies that are very paranoid about the impact these kinds of people can make. So to begin with, we should probably cover a lot of legislation. Um, it's all up there for you. It's quite complicated, so I'll take it bit by bit. As I mentioned, a workman's train is a train that is essentially run early in the morning at a very cheap rate. Now, in the 1860s, several commentators basically put forward the idea that these should be included in any act authorising railway construction in London. This is essentially because, obviously due to the railway mania, you have large-scale demolition of housing. For example, St Pancras, they build it essentially on top of Somers Town, which is a large slum. Um, the railways have immense power and essentially build where they like. There's a, a sort of nice story about a schoolmaster who finds two railway surveyors on his roof, um, demands that they leave. They refuse. He calls the police, and the police arrest him. Then a the year later, they knock his house down and put the railway through it. So this gives you an idea of just how powerful these, these, these companies are. Um, but eventually, you start getting a backlash. And the idea is that companies should compensate those people that they displace, but not to the extent that they provide housing for them. That comes later in the 1880s. Instead, what most authorization acts have is a special clause for workmen's trains. So when the Great Eastern Railway decided to build along the Liverpool Street in the 1860s, their act specifies that they have to run a single workman's train from Edmonton, which is about 10 miles out of London, to Liverpool Street at about 5 o'clock in the morning, and then back again for a rate of two pence per day. And it's the same with regard to Walthamstow. And the idea is that the people displaced will move out into these suburban regions and live wonderful, happy lives in the countryside. Now, of course, that doesn't really happen because what the railway companies actually do is let the landlords know that they're coming, the landlords kick out all the tenants and then pocket the compensation themselves. Um, and with regard to the Great Eastern, there were people who even 20 years later were still trying to get the sort of limited amount of compensation that was due to them to help them move out to the suburbs. The railway companies, however, see these workmen's trains as something that can also be quite beneficial to them. So whilst we have these sort of a great number which are set up in these acts, the private companies decide that actually at five o'clock in the morning no one's using the railway. And we've got these people living in sort of areas like Finsbury Park and they want a train service. So the Great Northern Railway, for example, receives a memorial signed by you know, numerous painters and decorators saying, can we have a, a two pence workman's train? And the directors go, well, well, we'll see. Yeah, we'll put it on. And it's very successful. It makes a profit. They extend it, they extend it. So the first workman's train that actually runs in the, metro the metropol metropolis is by the Metropolitan in 1864. And this is, again, the idea that they're trying to collect a sort of you know, your poor passenger who wouldn't otherwise travel um, very early in the morning where they can be kept away from the nicer people who travel slightly later and are willing to pay full fares. And so this system is what carry continues up until 1883. So the vast majority of workmen's trains run are voluntary, and the cheapest run are these ones which are authorised through these specific acts. Then in 1883, we have the Cheap Trains Act, which is itself... It basically comes from a group called the Travelling Tax Abolition Committee, who are out to abolish tax on all railway fares under a penny per mile, the idea that this will make it cheaper for the passenger. And Parliament decide that, OK, they won't tax fares under a penny per mile, but as part of that bargain, all railway companies have to provide sufficient trains for workmen. They never define sufficient trains for workmen, and as one can anticipate, this creates a large number of problems in the following 20 years. Um, under the Act, if anyone feels that there are not sufficient trains, a petition can be made to the Board of Trade. Uh, the Board of Trade can then force a railway company to put on additional trains, they can dismiss the complaint, or they can pass it on to another body called the Court of the Railway and Canal Commission. Um, the Court is quite literally a court. Um, counsel has to be provided for both sides, witnesses are interviewed, then a group of commissioners decide on the validity of the case. The problem is you have to pay a very substantial court fee, so this sort of system only comes into its own in the late 1890s when the London County Council, which is desperately trying to shift people from the centre of London because of the housing crisis, realises that 
rather than building its own housing estates in outer London, it can save itself a lot of money by forcing the railway companies to run these workman's trains. Um, and they start backing various groups who put petitions forward. And we'll have a look at some of the evidence that came out of those cases. Underlining the fact that the Cheap Trains Act is something of a, a failure, in 1899, the South Eastern of Chatham, which basically control most of the railways in South and sort of South East London, um, amalgamate. Um, these are two companies that have been at each other's throats for years, um, and the service was appalling, and they were nearly on, basically on the verge of bankruptcy, um, which is why private railway companies don't necessarily compete very well against each other. Um, as part of the conditions of their amalgamation, they were forced to run workman's trains in a 20-mile radius from basically the area around Charing Cross, which just goes to emphasise the fact that they weren't increasing the provision. Um, and what we can have a look at is the workman's fares charged in 1883. So what you can see is how lopsided this provision initially is. So this is the year the Cheap Trains Act is passed, and what you can see is up to the top in red, those are the 2D workman's trains running up to Enfield and Edmonton, the three dots out to the side of Walthamstow, and then out there we have East Ham. And you can see that's the furthest the two penny trains get. And they, they reach quite a, quite a way out. If you look at the area Dios was looking at in South London, he was essentially looking at this area here, which is Camberwell. Um, and obviously Camberwell is more of a walking suburb because it's quite close. So we're going to be focusing mainly on the outer suburbs. If you go 20 years later, and you can see the impact of the Amalgamation Act, and that's the, the new South Eastern and Chatham Railway, and they're all now offering workman's fares. But still, in terms of two penny fares, it's still that northeast area and out in towards East Ham. If you look over here, you begin to appreciate why the Cheap Trains Act didn't quite work. And it was because they never set a scale of fares for distance. It was up to the railway company to set the scale of fares. So if you lived in Ed Edmonton, you'd pay a shilling a week to travel. If you lived out here, you'd be paying about five times as much, at which point it becomes impossible to live there if you're a casual labourer. So what essentially happens is people, quite obviously, start moving when they're, when they're moving out into the suburbs, into that north corner and that eastern corner. Um, all the cheap trains run in the centre here are the underground, and they contribute to a, a massive increase in the number of people taking these kinds of tickets. So to give you an idea, in 1882, roughly 26,000 people take workman's trains daily. By 1902, it's about 320,000. Um, in 1912, around 25% of all tickets issued in London are workman's tickets. So they prove very, very popular. If we then look at well, a conversation between a railway executive and the London County Council. And this is where another unfortunate flaw in the Act comes in. So as I said, they have to provide sufficient trains for workmen. That means they don't have to run trains if no workmen are there. Now, if they don't run the trains, no workmen are liable to be there. So the railway companies essentially escape this obligation simply by saying, well, we can't run the trains because there's nobody there. The LCC, who are desperately trying to shift all these people out of the centre, are like, but if you run the trains, they will, they'll move there. The railway executives are like, well, but there's no one there. Um, and this sort of goes on for 20 years. And when it comes to the court of the Railway and Canal Commission, we have Mr Justice Wright. And this basically becomes the basis of the Act, which is that it's not the responsibility of the railway companies to provide trains where no people are living, where no workmen are living, but they have to provide trains where workmen are living and it's not considered to be you know, enough. So what happens is you get this essentially a sort of path dependency, where areas which had a very cheap workman service in the 1880s maintain their workman service and attract more and more workmen, whereas if you go out, say, southeast, southwest London rather, there are no workmen, so the fares where they're offered tend to be very high, no one complains because no one's living there. And this sort of gives you a good idea of the effect. Um, all workman passengers are in blue there, and all the red passengers are what termed ordinary passengers, so that's first, second, and third. And you can see quite clearly that you have very heavy workman's traffic in the northeast and a very heavy workman's traffic in the east, and then slap bang in the middle, you have this sort of very nice middle class traffic, ordinary traffic. Um, and this is something that we're going to be looking at in particular because all these lines are to varying extents controlled by the Great Eastern Railway. Um, the blue section on the bottom is the London Tilbury and South End, uh, which is separate, but and I'm going to wander away from the microphone, that'll sound interesting on the podcast. 
this is all Great Eastern, and that's all Great Eastern. And it's a major question of why that happens, but why that doesn't also happen. And it all comes down to this sort of slightly dodgy legislation um, which hang around the acts. The other thing that is important is, obviously you can offer cheap trains, but if the rent's very high, no one's going to go out and live there. Um, this gives you an idea of what a labouring, inverted commas, class house would cost to rent per room in 1902. And you'll see the northeast is one of the cheapest areas, especially if you compare it to the centre. So if you're dealing with a two penny train every day, you're essentially making money by moving out. Um, it's cheaper to live in the suburbs and commute. Um, and then if you look at population growth between 1881 and 1901, you can see that that is the key area. It's not entirely working class by any means. It also includes sort of Ilford, etc., which are very middle class. Um, and in part, it's because the Great Eastern Railway is one of the best suburban railways. Um, arguably in the world, as they claim in the sort of 1920s. Um, these are, this is a railway company that can basically dispatch a steam engine every minute, every couple of minutes. So it's exceptionally impressive given the technology of the time. So why do we get this split? And this is probably one of the key areas of what I'm going to talk about. Um, because essentially what's happening is you're segregating districts on the basis of class. And this is a quote from William Burt, who was the general manager of the Great Eastern Railway in the 1880s, and was up until, I believe, 1902 or something like that, um, when he went up to the board. Um, so this is a man who, very ironically, drove himself out of his own house. Because what his company did was basically was obliged to offer these very cheap workman's fares. The speculative builders came into the district. He lived in Stamford Hill. They knocked all of the very nice houses down and started putting up little terraced houses until William Burt decided that he was obliged to leave. Such was the deterioration of his neighbourhood. Um, so what essentially we have is a, a case of reverse gentrification. Um, and this is a man who clearly found the whole experience rather troubling because he then goes out of his way to try and stop it from happening again. So if I take you over to 1882, this is two years before the previous quote, um, you can see that he blames this degentrification on his railway line. Um, the Great Eastern was running a very large number of workmen's trains. They were only obliged, for example, to offer one to Edmonton. By 1883, they were running about four. Uh, and they were asked, why are you doing this? Um, and actually, the chap that asked them was a member of the Royal Commission. You know, why you, is this phil philanthropic? Um, and Bert replied, you know, however many people turn up, we are obliged to take them. And I think what is essentially revealed is the Great Eastern thought that by running these workmen's trains, but early enough in the morning, they could take advantage of this population but keep them out of the way. So even by sort of 1889, 1899, the last workman's train leaves Edmonton at 6.21 in the morning, so well in advance of the rest of the, the clerical passenger traffic. The problem is, in 1883, they get caught out because the Cheap Trains Act means they have to keep increasing the provision. And because no one else does, the workmen keep coming. So Edmonton sees a population explosion. Um, and so what we have is a company that sees the working classes as an incredible pain. Um, this is quite a good quote. It's essentially arguing for the ghettoisation of the working classes in London, um, as administered by Parliament. Um, workmen r spoil, spoil ordinary districts for residential purposes, in the words of William Burt. Um, he's happy to run as many workmen's trains as possible into the areas which have already been lost, but no further. A line must be drawn in the sand. And he spends the next sort of 20 years drawing that line in the sand and drawing it very, very successfully. So if we swift on, this is a quote from a sort of from Ilford Council. Um, well, Romford, Buckhurst Hill, Loughton, Wanstead, Woodford, and Ilford Councils. And this is 1911, and this is a case that comes before the Court of the Railway and Canal Commission, where the London County Council is arguing that the Great Eastern Railway is obliged to extend its workmen's trains out into Ilford. Ilford, at this point, is a very middle-class district. Um, it's lovely in the sort of contemporary parlance. They really don't want that to happen. And what you begin to see is that it's not merely the railway company, but the local councils that also start getting on board and start talking to each other and effectively colluding to block 
any extension of workmen's fares out into their districts. In contrast, if you go into Edmonton, because of the way the franchise works out there, you have an exceptionally radical council. So you have like a number of socialists involved in the council. The councillors are involved in what's called the Workmen's Train Committee. Um, they're very, very involved in all the events that that are to do with workmen's trains. In Ilford, it's exactly the opposite. You have a council which has seen what's happened in Edmonton, has seen what's also happening just south of them in East Ham, and are essentially wedged in and would quite like to keep themselves as clear of that as possible. Um, and one of the main reasons is that is because of rates. Um, the areas where you get a large influx of working class population, you tend to see an increase in the rates. And it's something of a rough measure because obviously rates are used to pay for infrastructure as well, uh, as well as, say, poor law provision. Um, and a lot of these districts also have a, a fair amount of building going on. But the highest rate in London between 1905 and 10 is there in Poplar, which isn't surprising. In I think 1920, you get what's called the Poplar Rates Rebellion, where Poplar Council get locked up for refusing to pay the, the rates because there's no equalisation of the rates. So you get a huge rate burden in places which tend to be the poorest district. The second highest rate is in Edmonton. And then you've also got sort of East Ham, West Ham, uh, Tottenham, and those sorts of areas. But if you go slightly further out, just in that wedge, you see the rate burden falls off again. So there's quite a nice correlation between areas that get very good workman's train service and areas which then have high rents, high rates rather, um, sort of just before the First World War. And that becomes you know, a major issue for those local councils because they don't want to see that happen. And this is what I would argue leads to effectively a kind of segregation in that because of the way the Cheat Trains Act has been interpreted, because of the way the railway companies are very keen to limit the districts where these workmen's trains will run, and because of the sort of active nature of the county councils that are involved, um, Edmonton, for example, desperately wanting more cheap trains, Ilford desperately trying to stop them, you get essentially an overload on the lines that back in 1883 had already given the best provision. Um, and I think that probably speaks for itself. Hopefully. Feel free to wholeheartedly disagree with me. Um, that would be more than welcome. Right. In terms of districts, we have just covered. But in terms of passengers, we have not. This is, again, another delightful William Burke quote from 1899. William Burke basically generates the best quotes, I think, of any railway executive, apart from the chap who's coming up next, who also has a delicious one. And for the, the purpose of the recording, I shall read it out. We feel that the proper working of the railway does require that there should be this separation between the different classes. Now, what the Great Eastern operate is perhaps the most sort of technically adept class-based railway system I think you'll ever see. So the way it works is before 6.21 in the morning, and we'll, we'll use Edmonton because that's an easy example. Before 6.21 in the morning, you have your 2D workman's trains. After 6.21, you have two trains at three pence. Then after that, you have a train at four pence. Then you have the half fare train, which is aimed at the clerical workers. And the half fare is with a minimum of four pence. And then after that, you have your ordinary thirds and your season tickets. And then after that, you have your nice sort of second and first class travel. Um, and this is not just reflected in the price system, but also reflected in the kind of passenger accommodation that they offer. So I'm going to read this quote out in full. It's a, I think it's a really good quote. It's from Frank Broad, who eventually became the MP for Edmonton in 19. Who was the MP for Edmonton in 1922? Um, it was something of an irony that. Parliament was rather dominated by railway directors before the First World War, who managed to put down a lot of this cheap trains legislation. There's a wonderful chap called Colonel Lockwood, who was a director of the LNWR, um, who said that something along the lines of whenever, it's, whenever anyone is struck by the idea of a philanthropic bill, it's always a cheap trains bill. Um, and basically, Parliament shoot down every attempt to expand the Cheap Trains Act after 1883. Of course, what they do by sort of bringing all these working class people together in a certain district is after the First World War and the Representation of the People Act, they create basically labour districts out in these areas. And Broad himself had actually travelled on the workmen's trains. So he stood up in Parliament and 
basically said this, which is, I have travelled up and down one section of these lines for over 20 years. That is the Great Eastern on the Enfield line. It has been my misfortune, yes, misfortune, to travel that line for nearly a quarter of a century, and I would desire honourable members to understand just what sort of conditions exist on that line. I travelled before I left the bench for this house. I joined the train three stations from one terminus and left it three stations from the other terminus. I travelled morning after morning and night after night. I have gone through a whole week and never been able to get a seat and never been in a compartment with less than 18 persons. The carriages are not suitable. They are the old compartment carriages, not the electrically driven ones. And this seems to be a reference to lighting more than anything else. During a hot summer, we had girls who had been working in underground warehouses, men who had come from the fish market with their clothes reeking from that market, men from the meat market and men from all sorts of industries, men whose work had made them perspire until their clothes were reeking with perspiration. There were 22 in a carriage, night after night, packed into the compartment with no means of getting air until I myself have had to get out midway and vomit at the station because of the condition of the carriages. Honourable members who represent the railway companies may laugh at such disgusting tales, but I have seen girls faint and men faint, this of course following their day's work. I want honourable members to recognise that these people in this great northeastern suburb of London are mostly industrial workers, perhaps the most patient, long-suffering, least vocal of any section of the working classes of the country. And anyone who still gets that train today knows exactly what he's talking about. <laughs> um, that was actually followed up by uh, the former director of the Great Northern Railway, who promptly exploded and declared that the working class passengers spoken of so fondly had been stealing the leather straps from his windows in his carriages. <laughs> At which point, the Labour MP for Walthamstow, another one of those working class districts formed by the GER, stood up and said, well, it's because your service is so rubbish, they have to walk to work, and they're actually replacing the soles of their shoes with your carriage straps. <laughs> so sort of uh, get used to it. Um, but that gives you an idea of the conditions that people were travelling in at the time. And essentially the Great Eastern would put on its worst possible carriages um, to run workmen's trains, followed by sort of nicer and nicer ones. Um, the conditions on the workmen's trains seem to be quite interesting. Um, for example, they set up what was called the Enfield and Edmonton Workmen's Train Mission, which was a multi-denominational mission, which took over several of the carriages, or one of the carriages, and would have sort of like prayers and hymns. Um, so, so that the, something along the lines of the gentle ears of the children would not be exposed to the language of the other men on the train. Um, although one of the other men on the train wrote into the Tottenham Herald saying that it was full of religious fanatics and it was driving him mad. Um, <laughs> The interaction between workmen and the other passengers was something that was occasionally strained. This is the other very good quote from Robert Perks, who was the general manager of the Metropolitan District Railway in 1906. Um, and you know, the image of workmen bringing home large logs of wood on a tube train um, whilst being <laughs> is extremely inconvenient, not merely to have a workman with his tools and his dusty, filthy dress, very often planked alongside one, but also bringing something with him with which he is going to light his fire. Um, and this again seems to be something which happened with a certain regularity. Um, you have people who, one of the other sort of arguments made by people like Dios is that when you lived in the suburbs, you were outside the range of the sort of like the inner London markets, like Billingsgate, etc. But of course, there's nothing stopping people buying things in the centre and then bringing it with them home. Um, and this seems to be something that happened quite frequently. Interestingly, the underground group, when they took control of the, the district railway, eventually came up with a regulation that you weren't allowed to wear dirty overalls on the underground. And it seems to be that that was actually the reason why, because it seems like quite a curious regulation. Um, that you essentially have to be clean. Um, so clearly it's, it's a concern. And the fear is, along with the sort of the fear of the impact of the working classes on certain districts, is that where you have workmen sharing spaces with you know, their social superiors, you generate a climate which eventually drives your you know, better paying customers away. The district line is probably a better example because when you have tube railways, well, I say tube railways, the district railway isn't technically a tube railway, but the underground tend to carry you know, a large number of people in a sort of less segregated environment. Um, 
certainly the district railway has the separate classes, but you get a large sort of quantity. There's complaints, for example, of workmen bursting into second class and even first class. Um, workmen occasionally going on with their two pence tickets and going into the second class compartments, claiming that because their ticket has a two on it, that enables them to go into the door which has a two on it. Um, I think actually there's a railway inspector from the Great Northern Railway who actually, actually gets killed swinging from compartment to compartment whilst the train is on the move to conduct a ticket check, which unfortunately is not a clever idea when going through a tunnel. That was the end of him. Um, but they become almost paranoid about some of this. And the Great Eastern is one of the worst. And if, oh, we should probably deal with that too. Um, this is Octavia Hill's quote. And this is leading me on to my next bit, which is the kind of workman that these people were. And I say workman simply because workman is the terminology used, but workman actually includes work women quite a lot. Um, this is one of the arguments that's always been picked up in the historiography over why working class people couldn't move out. Um, and you can see it talks about you know, the need for the rest of the family to be employed, the need to be at you know, certain urban markets, etc. Um, the breaking up of the family for meals. Now, if you look at the actual wages that some of these commuters were earning, you begin to understand that actually these people aren't the elite of the working class at all. So what I've done here is taken information from two court cases in 1899 and 1911, which both deal with the northeastern suburbs. Um, and what we have is a large number of child witnesses. Um, it's sometimes quite difficult to get the age because the way it is, basically witnesses are called forward and, and questioned by counsel, and the counsel don't always ask the same questions. But you can see that the average wage of the 23 child workers, the majority of whom all came from Edmonton, um, the weekly wage was nine, nine shillings eight pence, which is incredibly low. Um, the only reason they can do this is because it only costs them a shilling a week in fares. Now some of them pay slightly more because the problem you get with children and especially female workers is their working hours do not suit the working hours of men. So the male adult workers often are involved in say the building trade and they need to get into work by six o'clock in the morning. When you look at sort of child and female workers, they often don't start work until nine o'clock in the morning. So what happens is they loiter around the station um, and a few sort of novel things come up to deal with them. Uh, the, one of the parish priests at Edmonton actually gets All Hallows Church, which is just around the corner from Liverpool Street, opened up in the morning and then they stick all the girls in there. Um, so they get their burst of church on the train and then they're ushered into another church. Um, but also it's people who then, you know, they take breakfast in coffee houses. There's one girl who goes and has breakfast with her friend. Um, the, the inconvenience is there, but because it's cheap enough, they put up with this inconvenience and a large number of people sort of will do that. If we also look at the male workers, now they're sort of divvied up in a fairly eclectic fashion there. But if you look at the mean wages of the first quartile, so that's the first 25%, these people are earning wages between 18 and 20 shillings a week. Now that actually puts them, assuming they have a family of three, and we'll sort of discuss that, that actually puts them below the poverty line established by Booth, which is 21 shillings a week for a family with three people, with three children. I have, there's witness data from one chap whose name is Harry Chamberlain, he's a builder's labourer. He has eight children, none of whom are actually working. Now one presumes if Harry has a wife, she's staying at home to look after the children because if they're not old enough to leave the house, someone has to sort of be there. Um, and there's a very good literature on sort of wives and employment. Um, and essentially it's a sort of toss up between the wife going to work and having to get a child minder or something in, or having a child who's old enough to look after the kids. Um, in all of the witness data I've come across, there have been only a couple of adult women who were interviewed. Um, one was a widow who was being forced to work, and the other, her husband, was out basically sort of, sort of terminally ill, so to speak. Um, and she had become the main breadwinner and was traveling with her daughter down every morning. Um, and they were earning about 13 and 14 shillings each per week. But they were still doing it, so they hadn't given up living in the suburbs and moved back. Um, we can't really, we don't really know the family circumstances. The census tends to be a bit sort of hit and miss um, with the witnesses that crop up. Um, but certainly it was felt that wives 
were travelling. Uh, William Burt said that you know it was um, a fact that wives often travelled up with husbands, and the Great Eastern actually would set aside 200 tickets. Um, for each train, for the last train, just for women. Um, and about 25% of the people on the 621 from Edmonton would have been women and children. Um, if you look across the whole of London, some lines, you know, up to about 10% sometimes of the people travelling are women and children. That's on the basis of some LCC sort of um, surveys that they did. They're not particularly detailed. They simply list women, boys, warehousemen, clerks, that sort of thing. Um, but you do get, you know, an I think an increasing number of women travelling. It's very difficult to say because we don't have particularly good statistics for it. But the general manager, for example, of the Central London Railway said that, you know, most of my workmen passengers actually work women. Um, in 1895, the Board of Trade even launches an inquiry to sort of examine the problem of loitering. And they send a, a circular around to all the railway companies. And the most of them just, well, the Metropolitan probably sends the best reply back, which is, I have the honour of informing you that our workmen's trains arrangements embrace both sexes, and then completely avoids the question. Um, the Metropolitan District also say their own inquiries have revealed nothing. So it's possible that it's a particularly strong phenomenon around Liverpool Street, which would make sense because of the area you're in, you have a lot of sort of manufacturing which employs women. A lot of the people, for example, are employed at like Cross and Blackwell and that sort of thing in sort of factory, factory employment. But what this does show is that in contrast to this notion that you have to be an elite artisan to live out in the suburbs, these people are doing it in 1899. And many of them have been there for a considerable amount of time, sometimes up to 10 or 20 years. So the evidence that's put forward in the 1880s to the select committees, which has since been used in historiography to say that you know, working class people can't do this, isn't valid in the following 10, 20 years. And you also see this massive explosion of the number of people taking workmen's fares. And the Great Eastern in Edmonton are constantly putting on more and more and more trains. So I think they get up to 11 by this point. Um, so it's quite a considerable um, influence. And if you look at the, and this is one of the witnesses who's interviewed, this is probably the best bit about the Court of the Railway and Canal Commission in that they don't always just invite technocrats. They actually invite sort of passengers to come and speak. And I presume what the LCC did was they went around and selected the witnesses that would give the best story. Um, but essentially what you have here is a general labourer who lives in Edmonton and travels in and goes wherever he can find work which Octavia Hill would argue wasn't possible. Um, and he later goes on to say that he'd never actually worked in the home suburb. He'd done a couple of weeks, I think, and that was about it. And he'd never worked away from London. He simply went in every day. Now, how people then manage to find their work is something that's never quite revealed. But presumably, you have a lot of workmen travelling on one train, all meeting up in Liverpool Street Station. Um, so presumably, there would be some kind of information network. Um, also, you have breakfast. Now, Octavia Hill argued that breaking up of families for breakfast was, you know, one of the considerable, a considerable problem. William Burt also discovered that this was a considerable problem when people started bringing stoves and cooking fish in his waiting rooms, which he was not very pleased about. Um, and ironically, actually, well, I say ironically, uh, red herrings were one of the foodstuffs that the charity organisation, the charity organisation, health organisation, were going around telling working class people to eat um, because it was supposed to be very, very nutritious, that and porridge. Um, so clearly they took their advice and took it into Liverpool Street. Um, once they closed the waiting rooms because of this menace, uh, it seems that most people just went to coffee shops. Um, also, packed lunches proved rather popular. In 1899, there was a riot. Um, the Great Eastern Railway had suffered constant complaints about overcrowding. So they decided what they were going to do was, instead of issuing workmen's tickets on the day, they would issue a booklet for the week on Saturdays at noon. Now, of course, Saturdays at noon, most people who take those trains are at work. The Great Eastern also failed to advertise this fact. So on Monday morning, the workmen turned up and were refused entry onto the train the official at the station saying you'll have to pay the full fare for their third class ordinary. The workmen hijacked the workmen's train, they pushed the official aside, they got on the train and the train had to run in anyway. So the following day the police were at Edmonton station, the workmen did exactly the same thing and just pushed the police out of the way. Um, they got on the train, carted in again, 
At Liverpool Street, the police had deployed six officers to deal with the problem. Now, they reckon there was a mob of 2,000 workmen waiting for the six police. What then happened was the six police were very, very quickly ushered out of the station by force. The workmen broke into the taxi rank, flipped over a wagon, mounted a short stand, and then started hurling their lunch boxes at police. Um, so there's a wonderful line where a policeman's helmet was knocked off by a sandwich, which <laughs> proves that they were bringing packed lunches quite usefully. Um, and if you look at the people who were arrested, they're all sort of they're like general labourer, car man. There's a 17-year-old who's arrested for kicking a Great Eastern Railway official in the leg, um, and the magistrate just goes, it's fine. Um, it's all quite ridiculous. Um, there's also a couple of charges for incitement, someone screaming, mob and boys. Um, and there's a bit where basically 100 police reinforcements turn up, the police arrest a couple of people, and then a running battle takes place all the way to the police station. Um, the following week, it sort of calms, it calms down. Um, and what actually happens, and this sort of, again, sort of invokes this notion of a family unit, is that families send their kids on Saturdays at noon to go and buy the tickets for the parents. Um, and there's a like, sort of wonderful description of great sort of cries and boos can be seen, can be heard whenever the head of a railway official appears. Um, they really don't get on very well with the railway company, and the railway company, as we've seen, equally doesn't get on very well with them. Um, and the whole notion of having Edmontons all around sort of the outer areas is why you know, the Great Eastern Railway clamped down on it so much. Um, I emphasise Edmonton simply because there's so much evidence for it and there's a lot of cases put through on it. Looking at the back, we go back to the sort of the time-based approach to the railway. This is, I think, I, think this, I found this to be the best way of showing it. So this is Gustav Dorr's picture. Dore, sorry, picture of um, a workman's train in 1872 on the Metropolitan. And you can see our sort of almost troglodyte workman wandering around. Um, it's undoubtedly stylized, but it does give you a good idea of the kind of, the kind of people who were traveling on these early morning trains. There's another good one from the London Illustrated News, which shows the arrival of the penny train at Victoria Station, and you can see a couple of women there as well. Now, if you compare that, so this will be a train probably around 6 o'clock in the morning with this delightful H.M. Bateman cartoon, which is from the 1920s, which shows the 845, you get this idea of just sort of the idea of how segregated by class the railways are um, and how this sort of segregation policy suits the railway companies because you have to keep this lot well away from that lot. Um, and in fact, this sort of develops. So initially, as I said, in the specific authorising acts, you have a workman's train run back in the evening. What actually happens is that sometimes workmen can't get work because you have a casual labour market. Um, and these men will often just return to the station and loiter around. And so the Great Eastern Railway and all the other railway companies fairly quickly allow workmen to travel home on any third class train after 12 o'clock, um, 12 noon. Uh, and again, they're asked, is this because you, know, you want to, to provide for the workmen? And Bert's like, no. We had them hanging around, basically smoking and spitting everywhere. And the platforms got in such a state that ladies did not care to pass over them. So we said, go, just leave. Better that you're one or two of you are on the third class carriages home than we have a small mass of you waiting for our business executives when they finally turn up. Um, so you get this very good sort of graduation. Um, Pulaski in her book in 2010 argued that one of the thing, one of, one of sort of the effects of this sort of commuting was that workmen started to dress and act in demeanour like their middle class counterparts. That's something I certainly wouldn't agree with, um, and I doubt the railway executives at the time would, would agree with either. Um, the big changes to this system happen during the First World War, and it's because you get manual workers who start collecting war bonuses, and the manual, working, the manual worker's wage slowly increases, increases quite substantially. The workmen's fares are never increased during the First World War. So if you imagine it's a shilling a week in what, 1872, it's still a shilling a week in 1918 after you're, you've had a dramatic increase in income. Um, and what you also have is the introduction of the eight-hour working day. Now, this knocks out a lot of the, the support for this sort of class-based approach to railways because suddenly you have workmen who are both wealthier and who now don't need to get into work at six o'clock in the morning. Um, the shift to the eight-hour working day, I think, is, is incredibly important. 
um, and stems from a realization during the war that actually if you work people eight hours a day sort of every day they work much more productively if you work them 12 hours a day or give them ridiculously long shifts um, and this starts to break down the whole system what you also have is a sort of increasing almost militancy on the part of the London underground which becomes sort of more and more powerful throughout the First World War. Um, they carry something like I think it's 918 million passengers in 1918 which is a total that has only recently been bested I think in the last 10 years or so. Um, so and what happens is they launch a bill in 1920, which gets passed in 1921, and the first thing they put on this bill is the abolition of workmen's fares, the complete abolition. Um, they don't get it because obviously what happens is everyone immediately goes up in arms, but you have the creation of a Ministry of Transport as well, which again is like, we cannot keep maintaining these fares at this very low level, especially when they increase season tickets, I think by 50%, and what happens is a large number of those season ticket holders simply transfer down to workmen's fares as well. And it gets to the point where even the chap who's in charge of the London County Council tramways, and obviously the LCC is the main body that's trying to promote sort of suburban development, especially in the interwar period when they're building, you know, their Beacon Tree estates, uh, the housing estates like Beacon Tree. Um, even he says we can't, we can't continue running the system. It can't be done. We can't tell them, we can't tell them apart anymore. Um, because it's now getting impossible to tell who's a workman and who is like a, a lower middle class clerk. Um, and one of the good, sort of more interesting things we have from one of the court cases in 1899 is that one of the witnesses who's taking a workman's train is a, an attendant at the court the, the uh, case is actually taking place in. And he comes up and Mr Justice Wright, who is very, very forthright, um, just goes, well, he hardly falls within the definition of a workman, does he? Um, and the guy is dismissed, despite the fact that he's taking a workman's train. But his earnings are about the same as your standard manual labourer. Um, equally, later in the 1911 case, there's a compositor who's earning 60 shillings a week, which is quite a substantial wage, and he's taking a three-pence workman's train from Barking, and that's absolutely fine. Um, so you get a sort of breakdown of the, that sort of correlation between income and class, which becomes you know, incredibly precedent in the 1920s. Um, it doesn't completely go away because obviously after 1921 you get a slump and manual wages go down again. Um, and what you see is the railway companies use that particular sort of spike in wages to get through all their demands. So the two penny workman's fare disappears. All workman's fares, I think workman's fares are essentially in introduced everywhere, but they are pegged at half the third class fare. And with regards to, say, Enfield Town and Edmonton, which have these two penny fares, they go up hugely. Um, I think they put a limit on the amount they can increase, but it's still very, very substantial. I think that just about wraps it up.